Hi. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Vivian. And, uh, and uh, thanks, Sanders, for inviting us. Um, we've done this presentation a couple of times, and, uh, and so we've gotten um, some pretty good feedback. And um, I was talking to one person yesterday, I think it was, and uh, uh, about um, some health care financing in the state. And um, in the middle of the conversation, it, I hadn't looked at the oil prices for yesterday. And uh, so I said, I said, I haven't looked at the oil price yesterday. And she knew it like that. And I said, Dora, you're a health analyst. How often have you, um, since when do you file oil prices? And she said, like this year. Um, and I think that that is, um, that's pretty much, um, a common, becoming a common occurrence for a lot of, uh, people who are active in public affairs in uh, a lot of states in the uh, country, but particular in, in the United States and around the world, actually, um, but particularly in New Mexico, um, where an investor used to put their money into the fossil fuel sector and basically go to sleep and the dividends would come in and budget people in states that were reliant on uh, oil and gas revenues would plug in the assumption and you'd basically never hear about it again until you maybe you read an audit or something. Um, but now things have changed. Um, things are pretty volatile. Um, and, um, and mostly um, the news isn't particularly good. Um, and that's kind of where we're at. And what we're trying to do is to look at this um, situation, describe it as best we can, in the hopes that um, um, the next steps that people plan can be uh, well informed and um, and uh, successful. Uh, next next step. Next slide, please. Um, we're the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. We are all over the world. Um, we're small, but we are in about eight or nine different places in the world, and do work in about. Uh, 20 or 30 uh, countries and um, and our work is divided broadly on the one side of it we're in support of all kinds of sustainable energy projects as we're experts in finance and and energy and in the other side of it we're often involved with in opposition to a lot of the fossil fuel development that goes on so we're either one or the other depending on where we are sometimes we're doing we're doing both next slide please and you know you've all probably seen this slide, which basically tells you that uh, that the New Mexico's budget is heavily reliant on oil and gas revenues. Each year comes in through many different spigots, leases, royalties, various taxes, and what have you. Next slide, please. And um, over the last few years, the story has been. Um, up until the pandemic, you were hearing about record shattering um, revenues coming in and all kinds of new production goals being met and set and levels. Um, um, but what was also going on, and it's hard to understand, but it was, was that the industry was, is, was and is in steep decline. Next slide, please. And so what was happening is there was a awful lot of production, new barrels of oil and, and, uh, and gas coming in out as largely as a result of uh, what went on about, uh, over the last decade, which is fracking a kind of a new kind, a new technological way to uh, extract oil and gas in a far more efficient manner that allows for a, uh, an abundance to be created, an abundance that the country's never seen before. And that has flooded the oil and gas markets and driven down prices. And that's driven down prices to a level where um, um, there's a lot of uh, trouble right now. But mostly what New Mexico was seeing was um, they were seeing a lot of revenue because there was a high price period. Then the um, prices dropped but production remained pretty high for a bit. So your revenue still stayed the same, but for different reasons. Again, the budget, pe people don't necessarily see it in um, that kind of a change, subtle change, but it was a change that was mounting towards a fairly significant problem. Next slide. 
the way best to understand uh, this maybe is to look at um, <clears throat> the middle column there, the New Mexico crude prices. Um, from in the 2005, 2009 period, they were um, $67 a barrel, reasonably good, but really on the low side for the uh, for the industry. Historically, they popped back up into the 86 range um, um, from 2010 to 2014, and that's pretty high, and uh, it was even higher in, in some years. And so you saw um, a lot of revenue coming in into um, into New Mexico. Um, and then that odd thing happened. Actually, the prices collapsed, you know, 2015, 2016. And the overall price went, I was cut by almost half there, as you can see. Um, and then for a year or so, there was still production, but you have a very low price. And that low price is now kicking in and affecting production. And then we hit the pandemic. Next slice, uh, a slide, please. Um, and and uh, the pandemic, go back a bit, one, please. Oh, no, go, go, go ahead forward. That's it. Um, and so, so what was going on um, during the, the whole time underneath all that was that the major oil companies and, and the oil industry uh, in general was going down. As you can see, this is a profit picture. The major oil and gas companies have seen declining profits for the last 10 years. The Exxon, the dark red one, has gone from 25% uh, return annually down to six last year before the pandemic. And I don't imagine things are gonna be very good this year either. And all of them are like that. The, uh, the industry is in last place in the stock market. It used to lead the stock market. Um, and it's a very important um, phenomena uh, particularly for New Mexico, because what the pandemic really did was to trigger. It triggered a decline in demand. So you're going to, uh, there's less barrels that are going to be needed. And it lowered prices because demand went down and because there was a price war going on um, between Russia and Saudi Arabia, which I'll be glad to talk about later if you want. Um, but that's happening as the um, industry is in a decline. Next slide, please. And it's kind of known by the um, CEOs and uh, oil and gas people, who, sort of industry people who watch it, um, that this is a problem. And so Scott Sheffield, who does, you know, he's a, uh, for those of you who don't know him, he's the head of Pioneer Natural Resources, does business in New Mexico. The various holdings. He characterized uh, the pandemic, I'm sorry, he characterized the industry for the last 10 years as an economic disaster. That was the same 10 years where he was producing, his company, sorry, was producing the most oil and gas that it had in its history. So it was producing a lot, but it wasn't making much money. Next slide, please. And you'll have um, John um, and when he was trying to explain in the 2020 period around in the middle of the pandemic, he's asked like, so what is going to make you healthy? And he said, well, they could live with $50 a barrel oil. Um, and then he says, but, you know, we really wouldn't be doing too well um, at $50 a barrel. Um, and that was when he, they were all looking at $35, $30 a barrel. Um, and so 50 looked good to him. But of course, $50 a barrel will leave them in last place and will not really, it'll help the revenue picture for New Mexico better than a $30 barrel of oil, but it isn't going to lift it back up in that area where we were before, which is in the high 70s through the 90s. Um, that's not gonna come back and that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, and you have to, what I'm trying to also do here is to say that the energy people will have one view of what's healthy and the governmental officials um, in New Mexico and in other states are going to have to develop their own understanding of what is uh, a healthy picture. Next slide, please. So again, another one of the leaders in the New Mexico uh, market, Tim Leach, um, what he's saying here, he says private equity is closed, public equity is closed, and the debt markets are tougher. That he's basically saying here that the stock market, that's the public equities, 
they're dropping. That's what that 28% to 2% was that I mentioned before. The stock market is uh, uh, saying they're not worth the investment in their stock prices are going down. Private equity is a form of speculative investment that is used when an industry looks good, but it's got some more risk in it. Um, and even they're not interested. And then the debt markets, which are largely the banks, are, you know, are raising the rates pretty high. And so as an owner of a company, he's seeing you know, trouble, basically. Next slide, please. The Energy Information Administration, which is our, the US um, um, sort of uh, arbiter of, uh, of facts, um, it came out and said, well, you know, one of the major things that the industry is hoping to do is to ship a lot of gas out of the country, oil and gas out of the country, since they're producing a surplus. And um, they're basically saying that that um, um, trend um, that the industries were hoping to capitalize on is uncertain and it's unlikely um, to go forward in the future. Um, so your, your, your domestic market's a problem and your export markets are not going to um, help you out very much is what they're saying. Next slide, please. And so during the summer and even right now, as I did look today, um, prices are up a little bit. Um, and I think people uh, in the industry are a little bit happier by that, but it's in the high 40s and your revenues are not going to uh, pop back up in any meaningful way at that level, um, nor will the profits or stock prices. And so we're looking at a fairly uh, long-term uh, price, uh, low price scenario. Next slide, please. So we've been, we've been asked a couple of times, and here's some just future um, estimates. Um, the uh, your legislative finance committee, I think in September, this could have changed. Um, uh, we're at about $43 uh, dollars a barrel through 2022. World, um, the uh, um, WTI oil prices are looking at uh, the futures market that is uh, looking at about $50 a barrel through 2028. EIA, the uh, Energy Information Administration is pretty, uh, a much more bullish at $68 a barrel. That's still, I'm sorry, did something go on? Okay, it's still too low um, for the industry. Next slide, please. And so people asked us, um, what do you think, um, you know, makes this market turn around? Now, we don't think the market <clears throat> is gonna turn around in any meaningful way for uh, the industry or for your fiscal conditions, which is sort of the purpose of our report. And it would need to, and we would need to look like something like this. I was just reading on Exxon this morning and Goldman Sachs just, they said they need $75 a barrel, you know, going forward for several years before they're gonna be anywhere. So we were looking at it since probably 80, but 75 is a lot further, 75 and 80 are a lot, pretty far away from where we are now at the high 40s. Um, but that's what they would need. That's what they bought their oil, assuming. So there's a lot of oil in the ground that they now own that would really only be valuable uh, to extract if it was at the 70 or $80 level. You'd need robust markets for oil reserves. Right now, though, you'll see in the newspapers a lot of buying and selling mostly of, of oil reserves and oil fields, mostly at distressed prices. Um, you're seeing... Um, uh, rating agencies like Moody's um, saying that the debt levels are too high um, and you'd have to see a reversal of that. You'd have to see the debt levels come down, upgrades by Moody's. There's a lot of bankruptcies. You'd have to see that stopping. You'd have to see um, 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 increasingly debt being used for what it should be used for when uh, oil and gas companies borrow or use their own proceeds internally, they do that in order to produce oil or gas and then sell it and that's a revenue producing asset. Increasingly, they're using their borrowings to pay dividends to shareholders. In other words, profits that they really don't have. Um, you're also gonna need to see greater geopolitical cooperation right now. The markets uh, around the world are um, fragmented and uh, there's not much cooperation. And that causes a, a form of um, overproduction and instability. And then you basically need a market where there is no, no there'd be, be a very limited competition. Historically now, next slide please. Um, historically we're seeing um, 
um, changes in the economy, fundamental changes where economic growth is taking place and doesn't require as much fossil fuels. Um, that's just true. Um, we're not, you know, we're looking at a, a not uh, a less manufacturing oriented society, uh, economy with um, 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 a lower need even within the manufacturing sector for fossil fuels. Um, and then yeah, we're seeing electric vehicles, next slide in the automotive uh, uh, section, I'm uh, sorry, automotive sector, um, uh, taking up a, a bit of the, um, of the market share. You're seeing the same thing in utilities with electricity, when that natural gas, um, which once defeated coal, and put coal out of business now is being challenged by wind and solar um, energy. And you can see this uh, most pronounced in many of these states, including your own. Um, next slide, please. In the plastic sector, which is another big part of the oil and gas industry, you will, we've published a number of reports and you'll see that the plastic sector is facing many of the same problems that the more general um, um, industry is facing in terms of oversupply, low prices, and an inability to sort of get on track um, in, a, in a manner that supports um, robust profits and, and the kind of um, robust revenues that um, the uh, state has become um, uh, used to. Uh, next slide. So here, I just wanted to um, um, go back with you a little bit over what it means um, for, for the industry to be in such dire straits. This is kind of a chart of the, uh, the, uh, the sectors of the uh, Standard & Poor's 500. We, we blurred out all the other ones, but those little colors are all different sectors. And you see at the bottom in the, in the last several years, you see at the bottom is NERS. That's the energy sector. They used to be at the top of that uh, chart. Um, and they are now at the bottom and pretty solidly at the bottom. Um, and uh, this is important for two reasons. One, as you can see, why you're not getting much revenue out of them. They're not as profitable as they used to be. And second, the, most, the more important thing is we now think about, well, what do you do in a situation like this? Well, what this is showing you also is that the rest of the economy um, is, um, you know, um, is performing profitably. Um, they are, um, the energy sector is weak, but if you, if you look at it, you'll see a fairly strong um, progress in the information technology area, and you'll find uh, strength in the, in the, um, in the consu various consumer areas, the manufacturing area, while a little weak, is still pretty strong in the United States. The healthcare sector is pretty strong in the United States. What I'm trying to say to you is that it, within New Mexico, as in with almost any state in the union, um, that has a dependency on oil and gas, there is also another economy. And that other economy is doing better than your energy sector is. And we'll probably continue to do that. And that's the place to start as you look at this problem, which we're trying to say, this is a warning. You have some years, they're not going broke tomorrow, but you're not, you can see that you got a problem. And so next slide, please. And so what we're facing is lower for longer prices and, uh, uh, and we're facing an industry outlook where um, um, competition for both the small and the large um, companies in the sector are, is fa facing is negative. And, um, and then people have, uh, have been asking us, well, okay, we, we see all those things, but is this gonna turn around? Next slide, please. And so what I did here, and I'm, uh, I guess I'm going a little too slow. Okay, um, um, this is a view uh, that, that the Norwegian government puts out. Norway owns um, a lot of oil and gas, about 25% of its revenues, not unlike uh, New Mexico, comes from oil and gas. The left sector, the left side of the chart is um, the top blue line there, that big one that went way up. That's their oil revenues from 1970, you know, up until about the present. Um, and the black line is the deficit of the, the budget deficit for the country. And they're basically showing you that the 
uh, revenues annually would close their deficit and then allow them to um, um, have a surplus. And that surplus was being um, put into the fund on the right. And that's what that thing, uh, so, you know, going up. That's the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund. The 7.9 uh, billion kroner is a trillion. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not it's 7.9 trillion kroner. I think it is. Um, is one trillion dollar U.S. dollars. So that fund grew over 30 years um, to a trillion dollars. But the Norwegian government has now made it clear that they can no longer depend on these revenues. To answer the question, is this gonna turn around? The answer to one of the biggest holders of oil and gas, who's as dependent, uh, is very dependent on it, um, is looking at this and saying through 2060, that's what that chart shows on the left, um, there's going to be, we can no longer depend on those revenues. And, uh, and so we need to come up with different ways of diversifying the economy and, um, and therefore diversifying the revenue stream into the Norwegian budget in order to make sure that the country remains solvent and uh, people gainfully employed and the uh, economy going along, but that there is a structural deficit. And this is a, you know, uh, oil and gas is a world commodity uh, and they face, I would say they probably know as much as anybody uh, who's in the business um, about oil and gas and their conclusion is for them, for their budget and their people that they can't depend on the robust revenues anymore. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so, you know, um, I'm reading your papers regularly now um, in order to stay a little bit abreast of the uh, current budget cycle. Um, I've been involved in government finance, as Vivian said, for a long time, and I uh, can see the uh, the trouble of the commissioners putting together their budgets and, uh, and the governor um, faced with the, uh, what will be, um, you know, a difficult budget year. Next slide, please. And there are things that, you know, can be done and will be done to, um, to um, cover the shortfall and to try to make sure that the schools stay open, teachers paid and the hospitals and the, and the, the uh, child care apparatus in the state and the uh, and, uh, highways and what have you all, you know, continue to work um, in the midst of uh, severely depressed revenues, but that a larger picture is what's needed and a larger framework is needed. And that's kind of our, our perspective on this, uh, of where things are going. And we hope that People will look at the warning signs and say, okay, we have some time, let's see what we can do. So thanks. And I just wanna add um, another comment here. Uh, what's, what's happening is a change at the consumer end of the pipeline here, that, uh, that people are turning away from fossil fuels and the, com the competition that has ratcheted up in the uh, alternative energy sector, especially solar, but also wind, uh, how much more economically competitive it has become. And it's interesting to see how quickly this has happened. The uh, International Energy Agency just put out a report in which the, um, they, they would put out year after year, a couple scenarios, a main scenario, and then what if it happens faster and accelerated scenario? And what's happened is that the accelerated scenario for 2018 became the main scenario for 2019. And what they're saying is this is all happening a lot faster than we thought it would. And they, they are predicting that renewables are gonna be constituting a third of electricity generation very soon and that virtually all growth is going to be in renewable energy. So there'll be, you know, there's going to be a few projects that will slip in under the wire here, but we're really talking about a major shift, a major energy industrial shift that's happening. And New Mexico has to has to deal with this. You're, it's a very vulnerable state. So we're open to questions. And again, this is being recorded.
Thank you, Tom and Suzanne. And thanks for the reminder that this is being recorded. Um, we have a few questions that have come up in this in this side chat bar. If you have a question, please feel free to add it there. I'm going to go, I'm just gonna start um, going in the order that, in which I see them to, and I will read them out loud. So those on the phone um, are able to know what we're talking about. Um, and then also, if you have not introduced yourself in the chat box yet, please do so name organization, pronouns, and uh, geographic location, please. So the first question I have here is, isn't New Mexico's Permian Basin based, based part of the industry doing better than the rest of the industry worldwide? Um, <clears throat> okay, I could start on that in a couple of ways. Um, I think what I pointed out worldwide is that they're in last place in the stock market and failing. So um, to be at the top of that at best is better than being at the bottom. Um, but I'm not even sure if that's true. Um, look, you know, I, uh, we, the um, Exxon has been a major investor. I think the biggest investor in the Permian Basin over the uh, last five years, the return to them was 1% annually on an average basis. Mostly it was negative um, during those years. So I'm trying to figure out, I hear that all the time, that the Permian is, is doing really well and all that. And some of the operators are making money. I'm not saying that they're not, you are getting revenues still from them. You're getting considerably less. Um, and they are, um, uh, doing okay, um, I, I, and uh, comparatively to the Bakken, um, I guess they're doing a little bit better, but the kind of revenue base that you're looking to um, see is not there and it's not coming back. The second thing that I would urge you to make a distinction when you're thinking about this and you're hearing information about it, to make a distinction between what the industry is telling you is happening that is good and what would be good for the government of New Mexico. Because the industry you'll hear is a combination of them. Um, with them these days, it's a combination of, um, of um, hype and prayer. Um, that they're really um, laying out there. And so they'll say, well, you know, this is the, we're doing better than the other places. We're getting, you know, 50 bucks a barrel and uh, our costs are lower. Um, and, you know, there's still abundant bankruptcies in the Permian. Um, and that's because the, the, uh, the uh, markets are poor everywhere and they're doing a little bit better. So, the answer to the question is maybe, um, and um, we'll be publishing in the near future, and I think it'll clarify the situation a little bit. Um, but it is not, it is not where either the companies need to be for them to be healthy, or for the state of Texas or New Mexico for them to be healthy. I think we've seen some of this before, you know, in the trajectory of the coal industry where companies just did not pivot. You know, they just saw, well, our company will be the last one standing. You know, everybody else might fall away, but we'll still be there. And, and you know, we saw companies doing that and the next thing we knew they were in bankruptcy. So we are seeing an overall trend. How long it takes is gonna vary among companies and regions, but it's happening and it's happening faster than anybody expected it to happen. And these are forces that, uh, you know, the state of New Mexico can't change these forces. Thank you. Okay, the next question is, um, the New Zero Emissions Transportation Association is a consortium of major electric vehicle companies, battery makers, electric utilities, which launched in November. Their goal is by 2030, 100% of car sales will be electric. What happens to the oil industry if this happens? That's going to hurt. Gasoline is, you know, that's that's one of the main, main products 
from oil, from the oil industry. So electric, electric vehicles are definitely a major um, competition factor for the oil industry. And they are definitely happening all over the place. Uh, there was a Bloomberg report in 2019 that said that, uh, that the share of electric vehicles was going to rise to 28% by 2030. And that was a very conservative estimate. Even that would be a big chunk, but it's, it's definitely a major factor that's gonna affect the market. Yeah, I look at the, um, the uh, if you read the industry's analytics, they will say to you, they will say, well, automobile sales um, are likely to be, it will have an impact on our, um, our demand and production, but it will be limited and marginal. And uh, they then quickly um, pivot to the other areas of um, where their markets are, aviation, um, various kinds of industrial uses and what have you. Um, and, um, and so you come away with the picture, well, they could probably absorb it. Probably, you know, yeah. Um, but the, the, the premise of the oil and gas industry has always been robust growth. That's how it has made its money um, through the um, uh, boom and bust cycles. Um, and what you're seeing is, uh, you know, take it if you were a board member of, uh, of one of the oil and gas companies and the CEO and the managers come to you and say, well, you know, the auto sales are gonna take us down. You know, maybe we'll lose a couple of percentage points off of our, off of our um, annual sales because of the electric cars. And that's gonna take a while to absorb, you know, and that's fine. And then the next month they come in and say, you know, um, the, uh, ple the uh, petrochemical goal, goal, goal. Uh, com companies that we have, we have. I'm, I'm getting feedback. I'm getting feedback. Maybe I should turn Maybe my, I should turn Oh, my video off. Hold on. You're good, Tom. You're yeah. Good. Okay. All right. Anyhow, um, the uh, so then you then they, they say they tell uh, they tell us the board members. Well, you know the plastic stuff. These recycling programs are beginning to shave some of our revenues. Now remember, we're already got a revenue problem, right? So the second month they're now telling you, well, they're going to shave a little bit off of the of the plastic thing. The third month, you know, they come in and they say, you know, the natural gas sales aren't going so good because of all this wind and solar power, and we're gonna lose a couple of more revenue points there. Um, and so any one of them independently, I get, and there's more, I just will stop there. Um, any one of those independently, you know, could probably be absorbed. Um, those hitting cumulatively, which is where it actually hits as a cumulative measure in a company like Exxon or Chevron or whatever, um, it becomes a downward, cycle on the growth. And if the companies can't grow at a three or 4% trajectory, they're out of business. That's what we're seeing. They're not growing like that. So the answer to the question, the long answer, the short answer is, yeah, it's gonna have an impact on them. Um, they may tell you it isn't gonna be much, um, but when you take it cumulatively, it's a lot right now and it isn't considered to be much, but there is a lot of money now. If you look at the auto industries that Suzanne was talking about in terms of growth, if you look at where the growth money is going in the auto sector, you know, increasingly that growth area is going into the electric vehicle side of the equation. But even within the auto companies, there's a fight. There's a debate going on. And right now we live in a time of transition and there's a time of conflict between that. And so, it's a risk for the oil and gas companies. Um, and it's part of a cumulative package that we're really talking as to why we don't see a comeback. Thank you. Um, okay, the next question is, what are the implications of Conoco purchasing Concho assets in the Permian Basin? 
you're going to see a lot. And um, they're hoping that the uh, kind of the the the, um, the investment thesis is, you know, we can buy these assets. We have a we have money of our own. We're bigger, and we can buy some of the assets um, and and use them. Um, in the market and 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 uh, um, generate cash and the mix of our assets and their assets at least gives us a cash bump going forward and then you know they're hopeful that the markets will turn around and they will um, they will um, uh, do better. What we you know what we see is um, declining asset values. Um, what we see is that the number of wells. Um, that the companies um, both have in their ownership and in their, um, uh, buy, you know, the buying and selling are really extractable at a $75 barrel um, plus going forward. So the nice part of what I say is that they may get a cash bump going forward. The other, the not so, the harder analytical bottom line is it looks like they're rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, uh, the, uh, the, they just are moving things around. This, is, this goes on in every industry, you know, that's in a decline. The industry would like us to believe this is the normal buying and selling of assets, which is true within the, within the sector that has always been a buying and selling of assets. But where you see the trouble is that this, the price of the sales, they're usually not publishing them because they're so embarrassingly low and the losses are so high. Um, that you can't tell. So this, you're going to see in, um, I guess the next um, reporting period is early February, and you're going to see headlines. And you're seeing them now because they're trying to prepare the markets of Exxon to write off $20 billion, Chevron to write off 20, but that means the value of their assets are all lower. Um, and that, that they've basically lost that money, right? So Exxon used to be worth about 500 billion it's worth about 140 now so they've lost 360 billion and invest their money poof it's gone and most of the other companies have lost a you know a commensurate amount so you know i'm not it, it, it would take me it would I, you'd have to see really good results um for the next several years for me to think that that particular sale is any different from any of the other ones and and, and i don't think it is so i would say you know, they're, they're trying to find ways to get a business model that works, but they won't. Um, I think this is somewhat related to what you just said, but um, the next question is, I read Exxon will continue investing in the Permian Basin. Will this have any effect on New Mexico's oil revenue, regardless of world production? Well, you know, I, I know Exxon's continuing to invest in the Permian, whatever that means. I don't know what that means actually. Um, and uh, and you wouldn't either if you really read their books closely, you can't really tell what they're talking about. But look, the return over the last five years is 1%. That's what they published. And uh, so they're gonna continue to invest in something that's been producing not very much value for them. Are we supposed to be I think that that's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's good that they're pumping money in and that some people can go to work and that's good. Um, um, but over the longer run is, you know, which is really what you want out of a, out of a source like, uh, uh, like Exxon or, or whatever you, um, the answer is, I don't quite understand that based on their prior results. I don't understand it based on their, um, the uh, steps that they're taking to improve um, their position, I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure. I mean, they, they also have said, they didn't say it, they got leaked, that they're looking at uh, oil and gas prices that are somewhere between 15 and 20% lower than they've been telling their investors up to now that leaked out. That is not a good sign. That is not a sign that they're gonna be producing more out of the Permian or any other asset that they have.
Okay, I'm going to combine um, a few LNG questions. Um, the first, and I'm just going to read them, and then um, because I haven't had the time to really condense them, so I'm just going to read them, and then Tom and Suzanne answer how is best for you. Um, I like so. The first is I'd like to hear more about the international market for LNG. How confident are we about the transition internationally? The second related one is about the Costa Azul project, which would tap the Permian gas. What are the prospects for Asian LNG demand? The Permian rig counts were over 100 during the boom, fell to the mid 40s, and today stand at 58. Infill drilling by the majors. Um, the last one is you mentioned utilities are already skipping over LNG as bridge energy. The recent reports from Europe are saying that if American LNG were big, were cleaner, excuse me, i.e. not from fracking per se or other factors, there'd be a potential market to compete against the Russian LNG. Reasonable or too many moving parts? So there are a lot in there around LNG. Can you also, because there's a lot of um, insider language there, distill yeah. some of that, those questions for people who are less familiar with this issue. Thank you. Yeah, can you read the one, the third one where it has all the numbers in it? Like yes, that. that was about the, well, Permian gas, the Costa Azul project and the prospects for Asian LNG, I think, which also relates to the last one, which is around Russian LNG. The, yeah. it says the Permian rig counts were over 100 during the boom, fell to the mid 40s, and today stand at 58. Okay. Okay. So the, an interesting way to look at this is to sort of, um, the thesis behind the investment and the investment thesis for LNG is that in the United States, we have produced a surplus of natural gas because of fracking. It is a, it is one of the, probably one of the mo uh, more significant technological advances um, of, uh, of, of industrial, of an industrial process in maybe 50 years, if not longer. Um, and um, and it, it created a massive amount of, um, of natural gas such that the markets are, are oversupplied and um, driven the price down. And the business model itself has never produced profits that are sufficient to uh, warrant uh, more investment. It's sort of been rolled for a decade effectively. Um, and, uh, and so the idea was, well, we have so much natural gas, we should be exporting it as a, as a you know, the, so, so that others will buy it and that will, you know, balance things out against the fact that we're sort of oversupplied within the United States. That's sort of the investment thesis. If you look at the rest of the world, you will see that the centers for natural gas production in Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Russia, oil, uh, Russia's uh, gas uh, production are all in one way or another, improving their efficiencies as well. Everybody is producing more natural gas at the same time during a time when the markets are oversupplied. It, so what happens is you'll have um, um, terminals that are gonna be built in the United States that'll probably either wind up being used for something else or not at all. And you'll find um, markets being canceled, prices being driven down to the level where they can't, where no, where they can't sustain profitability. And if, the re repercussions in other parts of the world are very different than the repercussions in the United States. Um, so you have an oversupply um, 
generally around the world. On top of that technological market dynamic, you have a level of competition among the producer nations. In most countries outside of the United, the United States, the natural resources are owned by the government. So Saudi Arabia, Russia, Qatar, Libya, you go on and on and on and on, uh, China. Um, they all own their um, natural resources and they handle them um, in China, for instance, different economic system completely. Um, but what you're, what the, the, uh, the, what's not very, very different is that they all want a market share. And there is um, now what you would call a fragmented or very weak political cohesion amongst the oil and gas producing nations, which means that they don't work in tandem, they don't trust each other. And what do they then do? They produce as much as they can in order to get as much market share, share as they can. And often that just drives down prices even more, which weakens the whole uh, 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 concept um, you know, worldwide. So what we have is an oversupplied system in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where the producers won't cooperate to change the market dynamics. And, um, and you have a very difficult situation and it, and it isn't one that's promising for the um, LNG producers, shippers or the terminal developers in the, in the country right now. So you can see a generally weak market um, that is not going to um, um, do what it was anticipated to do, which was the export sales would, would um, 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 prop up, I mean, it, it absorb the oversupply. I um, and thank you. Not a problem. And that's separate from the environmental question mm -hmm. of uh, you know, if we sort of cleaned up our gas productivity, would it be more our, our, our uh, gas production process so that we had less methane leakage? Would that make our gas more attractive? Which is a whole nother question that becomes relevant when you have for example, the European Commission issuing a strategy to reduce methane emissions and stating that they're going to be that they're going to be using policies to try to reduce that footprint. And so you had the NGSA uh, withdrawing from negotiations for a 20-year supply contract with a LNG. Um, operator in the United States in November because the French government said, you know, this is going to conflict with our climate change goals. Yeah. I mean, well, we're trying, what we're trying to say here is not that this is going under anytime soon or it, it is um, going to um, um, fail in, a, in an apocalyptic sense. Um, you have an industry that historical model is it needs robust growth and that robust growth is what allows it to reinvest and to continue um, in investment going forward um, and the best way to, to, to put it is that that's not going to occur so when i showed you that chart that showed all the profits going down when the industry is returning 15 to 20 and 25% profits, that's robust profits. It's healthy for them. And when they're in the 6% range, they are in, their business model is in dire trouble and there's no incentive for reinvestment and there is um, likelihoods of bankruptcies and, and the like but they'll still be producing some revenue. So New Mexico will receive revenue from the oil and gas, it's not gonna stop. And what our warning is, is that the tendency is to think because of the way the histor history of markets has been, is that it'll go back up, everything will be fine. And we hit these, we hit these highs and lows and that's life in the oil and gas industry. What we're trying to say to you is that something historically has changed here and we can pretty much describe what that something is. Um, and it requires a different kind of um, fiscal planning um, and economic planning by governments that are involved with it. 
Okay, thank you. Let's, we'll keep moving. We have a number of additional questions. Um, one is the, um, just if you would parse out the difference between natural gas and oil for those who are new to this issue, please. Well, they both come from the same place. Um, and uh, what happens is, is it gets some um, um, different, depending on where you're drilling and what the geology is, is a different mix of, uh, of gas and oil. Some of it's almost all oil, some of it's almost all gas, and sometimes there's a mix. And at the wellhead, um, things start to get separated. The uh, content seems to get se separate and the technologies take over and there's various some um, cracking, fracking, fragmenting, boiling, cooling processes that go on to get you to, uh, to get gas into its component parts and to get, uh, and refining, and then to get oil into its component parts of, uh, of various forms of gasoline, um, various forms of um, lubricants, various forms of, um, of uh, uh, plastics that are used in oil and plastics that are used in uh, in gas as well. So it's a process of separation, you know, uh, separation. And it's it's the number of products that get separated out of oil and gas is um, you know, there are base chemicals that get separated out, and uh, then they get turned into infinitely more sophisticated and complicated products. And by the time you get everything done, it's probably, it's every, if you look around the room that you're in, I would say probably most of it is made out of something related to fossil fuels. The paint on the wall, the plastics that uh, hold our computers together, the, uh, you know, every, almost, you know, there's an awful lot of it and, uh, and it's used in different ways. So it starts at the well and they get separated um, some, somewhat by nature and somewhat by, uh, by uh, technology. And gas, once it's processed for marketing, it's just basically methane. It's, it's um, a very, very powerful greenhouse gas, and it's also something that can leak very easily, so it's very hard to control. Years ago, people thought of gas as being the clean fuel that was a great replacement for oil, so you had a lot of oil oil burning electrical plants replaced by natural gas burning electrical plants and people thought that was a good thing um, until they became more aware of the problem with the methane and the leakage and the global warming impacts of that so that's that's why natural gas was considered to be a bridge fuel for a long time. Like, well, we'll eventually get to wind and solar, but in the meantime, we'll use natural gas. And what's happening now with increased competitiveness of, the, of uh, wind and solar is that more and more utilities are making a jump from coal or oil directly to renewables. They're, they're skipping the bridge. And that's having an impact on the market for natural gas. It's also true that in many instances, the drilling for oil, um, when you're drilling for oil, the gas is almost a waste product. So I, that's, that's, a waste. that's why you see flaring, right? It's not worth it to them to put it into a pipeline and pump it somewhere. Um, so they'll just burn it right at the uh, right at the uh, wellhead um, or very uh, close to it, and. Um, you know, and sometimes depending on how the markets go, then it may be then worthwhile for um, companies to um, companies to um, um, take the um, uh, gas and, and process it. And so, so there's a shift going on, and that's a function of how the markets are moving and uh, how the technologies are set up. Um, and uh, and so and then after all that gets processed, then there's a, a system of markets that are actually the you know the, of how the um, how the um, um, oil and gas gets used, um, and then how it's bought and sold all across the world in various forms and sub markets. It's actually complicated to explain, and when you get into it, it gets a little complicated at first. But then it's just a system of markets and commodities, you know. Supply, demand, price, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty, you can figure it out. I'm looking at the time. Um, we have several more questions and I don't know if, and I know a lot of people have other calls right now, but Tom and Suzanne, do you yeah. still have- a few I'm minutes? all right for a bit, yeah. 
Okay, if people want to stay on, we still have a number of people participating, please feel free. I'm gonna to try to get through a handful more questions um, while people are participating. Um, for those of you who do need to jump, thank you so much for joining us. We'll send out the, a link to the presentation. I'll resend a link to uh, the full report and then um, as well as some of the coverage that the report has gotten and the op-eds that have been published that Charles put in the chat. So I'll send out some materials um, to everyone. So if people are staying on, we currently have 41 people still on the call, then let's just keep going with some of these questions. Um, and thank you again, everyone for joining us. Um, one that came up, um, and unfortunately I just saw that Eric Griego had to jump off, but he, um, he asked a question that, where did it go? Um, he asked if there's a revenue model where renewables can replace anywhere near the income to state government that oil and gas revenues have. No. Um, the, uh, um, from a revenue perspective, um, uh, renewable energy is, um, is a uh, is a uh, form of en is a form of energy that will produce um, profits and will produce taxes at a um, steady and modest level of uh, of um, of uh, revenue and, and tax. Um, it's not going to be ever the the gushers of. Uh, of, uh, of uh, money and uh, product um, that was produced by the oil and gas industry. Um, it, it has a completely different function in the economy. Um, and the, the, the nature of how profound this is is quite remarkable. But the oil and get, the uh, wind and solar sector has an, uh, an ability to cut the cost of energy um, dramatically into the economy. And that means that there's a generalized economic benefit and that means we pay less for gas pump, we pay less for um, electricity, we pay less for heating. Um, and as we households, businesses have much lower cost inputs into, the, into their production processes by using um, the non-fossil fuel um, energy. So the value, the value that's created in the economy, is is huge. But the, the but we don't charge very, we won't you don't charge very much because the cost isn't very much, and over time and you and so you will have less revenue coming into a solar farm, let's say, than you will to an oil well. Um, and, uh, and so the economics will work differently and the benefit for the economy um, comes about differently. It's an energy transition. It's a major change in what we're doing. Um, and so there will be revenues, of course, from any, like any facility um, um, like that that's, that are put into the community. So wind mills and what have you will all pay taxes. Um, but they are not going to have the same um, Im impact as the um, as the um, oil and gas industry uh, did, because it's not you're not you, you know the, uh, you, the federal government and the state government doesn't own the wind and the sun, um, and which is a major part of how New Mexico gets its uh, oil and gas. So it's a different, it's a completely different form, uh, structure. Um, and it's actually from an economic point of view, it's cheaper overall. And the benefit comes through the economy, which is why you need a, um, a sort of a different uh, business model um, to look at the, um, the uh, implications for revenues for, for uh, places like New Mexico. So no, it's not going to produce the revenue, but, and it'll produce levels of jobs that are probably commensurate, if not more, um, than, uh, than uh, and it'll produce economic activity that will probably be more as well um, than what oil and gas did. But ultimately, I think what he's asking is, can you just replace, can, can, they, can New Mexico solve its economic crisis by just replacing 
the assets that it has that are petroleum based assets with renewable energy and I think the answer to that is no they have to develop a whole new economic model of diversification. Well you said economic I think what he was asking for is can you swap revenues will will the revenue that are produ the revenues produced for New Mexico can you can you uh, simply swap out that's that which we got from oil and gas with solar and wind engine? The answer is no. Um, the, on the economy, I would argue that jobs and economic activity. The answer is yes. Right. The benefits will be broader, more diffuse. Right. Um, the, another question is, have you studied the human welfare outcomes with fossil success? Does the income result in direct improvements in outcomes for kids, people, and communities? I don't understand the first part of the question. Um, have you, well, um, I don't know if the person who asked it is still on the phone. Let me see real quick. Um, Camilla, this was your question. Do you want to explain a little more what you mean? Well, you know, there's just this whole sort of boom and bust cycle. The money comes, the money goes, and yet we're still always last on the list of success. And I just wondered if you'd done any research beyond the economic to look at social welfare outcomes with relationship to fossil incomes in different states or in New Mexico. I'm still not sure. Is, is the question whether or not the incomes from jobs from the fossil fuel sector and the incomes from jobs in other areas, have we looked at that? Is that, no, doesn't sound I wasn't, like that's what you're asking about. I wasn't actually talking about jobs, although yeah, there's a relationship there. I just yeah. mean, you know, when we are booming, the, yeah elected leadership will say, okay, great, we've got a chance to fix all these problems by flooding our agencies with additional funds and debating whether to do that or keep it in the permanent fund. And um, I just am, I continue to try to understand why our social well performance, welfare performance on child poverty, on addiction issues, on whatever it may be, we continue to struggle with no matter how much fossil fuel income we have to throw towards the problem. And so I just wonder if there's like underlying math that can tell us something about why and when we're successful and why we're not and what that has to do with our state's um, income levels. It might be too much uh, social studies, but I just wonder why or why not income equates to to social success or not. It's a pretty big topic. How you um, how you distribute how you distribute income? Like um, we don't we we generally do it through the market system, and the market system creates extraordinary imbalances. Um, and our attempt to then adjust for those imbalances through state activity um, is horrible. Um, we, uh, the uh, methods of um, income supports are, you know, um, denigrated in the society. And so people are not very, the, the uh, public attempts to adjust for imbalances that the markets have created are quite um, poor. And so kids get it and uh, single mothers get hit and, uh, and the like. And, um, and so you need a system, you know, I mean, one of the ways we help to eliminate, well, to, to significantly decrease senior poverty was with the social security system, which was put in place many, many years ago, but the level of uh, senior poverty declined if you look at it historically from that, but the social security money is really sig not significantly uh, enough uh, either for the senior population. For the kids, you know, we have had, we've put in place 
various kinds of social welfare um, funding uh, and the public assistance and what have you. That is, you know, sub 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 poverty in every state in the nation, um, and that's not going to change anytime soon. They've tried income. Uh, child tax credits and earned income tax credits and what have you, and that there's something for poverty, but but um, but not enough. Um, the country has tried a couple of times historically to deal with a guaranteed income and rejected it all the time. But it's probably time to rethink that um, as we go through this particular change. But I don't know that that answers the question, but. It's a bigger one than fossil fuels, um, but fossil fuels issue raises it pretty substantially, I think. Um, you know, we look at it from time, we've looked at it in other, in other countries and uh, mostly in my own work outside of IEF, I've been heavily involved for a very long time in, uh, in systems of income distribution. Okay, I have several more questions, but I'm gonna, ask one that's not related and then I'm gonna to try to condense and combine the others. Um, I think they're somewhat related, but maybe with a couple extra parts. So the first is, do you think that the potential commodification of oil and gas waste, i.e. produced water, has the potential to offer companies a lifeline, especially in New Mexico? Do that one again? Do, basically does um, commodifying or being allowed to use produced water um, outside the oil fields, give the industry a lifeline, especially in New Mexico. I don't know. I'd have to hear more. I'm not quite sure what the question is. I'm not. I don't, so. There is a, an effort now to yeah. um, allow the oil and gas industry to utilize the wastewater outside the oil fields. So perhaps for agricultural purposes. So right. um, that is ongoing. So the question is, will that essentially provide the industry a lifeline to succeed? I mean, as a source of revenue, huh? I think so, yes. Rebecca, if you wanna add anything, jump in. Yeah, I can just throw out, I mean, we hear numbers nationally of a hundreds of billion dollar potential produced water market coming in the next three years in New Mexico. Um, and what that use is for agricultural or even compact uses to, um, to be able to compensate for Supreme Court rulings potentially um, and New Mexico's arrears. Uh, the ability for industry to make money off of that new revenue stream, does that impact this analysis or your projection for the down market in New Mexico? I, don't, I haven't really seen the numbers, but from what you just described there, I have to really would have to take a look at the numbers. It doesn't sound like it's a enough to make a difference. And I'm not quite sure whether it's sound, um, but... Um, but anyway, I have to take a look at it. If you want to send me stuff, I'm more than glad to look at what the uh, what the what the issues are, and what's being bought, and what's being sold, and who owns it. You know, um, the, the level at which you're talking about it doesn't. I mean, uh, it doesn't. It, you know, it could help, but it's a marginal help. I can connect, uh, Rebecca. I can sure. connect with Tom after. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, um, so I'm going to try to clump some of these questions together. I mean, so one that was put pretty succinctly was just what is the timeline for the industry being greatly reduced in the Permian? Um, and then that I think relates to the question around how will Biden's plan to end fossil fuel subsidies affect the markets, and I think probably specifically New Mexico. So let's start there and then maybe some follow-up. I think we're going through a wave right now of, um, of, um, of write-downs uh, on the value in the Permian. And I think 
it'll substantially reduce what we think is possible there. Um, so, uh, my tendency is to think that, I mean, uh, uh, um, you know, from a barrels produced point of view, it'll be, you know, they'll go down, it'll go down uh, more gradually, I think, than the money will go down. Money will go down precipitously. And, uh, and then it's uh, just a, uh, a process. But, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, you know what I would do is I would say to you, um, send me a note in February, and I'll because the, the number of changes that we're going to see in the end of year analysis, both because of the pandemic, is, is going to show you a smaller, probably will show you a smaller Permian basin, um, and I think um, and that'll give you some sense of. Uh, some sense of uh, of what of the of the rate of uh, change, and then there'll be other things that are kind of like getting uh, contingencies as to what's what's going to happen. But uh, for for the purposes of what we're talking about here, we would say act now um, to to do things. And then Biden cutting subsidies for um, I'm not quite sure what that. What that all means, um, I would again. I would need to see. It. I mean, I did look at the uh, idea of the um, the um, fracking uh, fracking uh, what they call a ban, I guess, and uh, on the f federal lands, and uh, and I'm looking at it and saying it probably is a benefit for the industry, um, and um, they will complain about it, um, but um, it will be a benefit. And the reason it's gonna be a benefit is because if it succeeds, it'll be a planning process. It'll be a public planning process about really how much oil and gas is going to be produced from federal lands. Um, and anything that intervenes in the process right now for establishing rationality in the process is going to drive prices up. And frankly, that's what the industry needs. And so in the short term, it'll probably drive prices up. It'll probably drive production down somewhat. And then over time, depending on how they actually do the, the, uh, the um, curtailment or ban, on on federal lands um if it's orderly probably won't be but if it's if it's orderly um you're going to have a, a a clear rational um perspective that the market can respond to and in that respect it'll be a it'll also be one of managing an upper limit and it should put it should raise the prices for the for the industry. They will hate this. They will oppose it, um, and they would prefer to go bankrupt um, rather than to have them be told where and how much they can um, they can produce, even if what they're producing is bankruptcies. If that sounds irrational, it is. But if that sounds if that's what the the view is right now. That's the view I would say of uh, of most of the oil and gas industry. It will help them. And we went through this with the coal industry where we had asked the Obama administration to do a moratorium and we were all asking them to do it because we wanted to limit the amount of coal going out into the markets. And we thought the federal government could help with that process. But what I kind of understood is that these guys were going under and the best thing that could happen is somebody take away their, take away the amount of coal they had so that the price would go up and they would still go under over time, but they would go under and they would be more, it would be more profitable and it would be more rational um, and more secure for employment and be more secure for the pension systems for the workers and all. Uh, but they didn't care about that. They basically told us no, they opposed the moratorium um, they did everything they could to block any process going forward uh, regarding the coal lease moratorium. And then when Trump came back in, he got rid of the moratorium and um, the market collapsed further. 
And then th this is a related, these are related. So um, can you comment on the factors and implications of the oil and gas industry stockpiling leases and drilling permits despite the current economic and financial dynamics? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, their thinking, I guess the thinking is that the, um, I think the thinking is that the morator a moratorium will end their ability to get permits. Um, and so therefore they should get as many as they can now and that that all, all the economic activity would be grandfathered in and not touched by a future ban on permits, right? So we'll be able to do that. And therefore it's a good investment because they're gonna curtail the market. And then what we have in hand and are able to develop, you know, we, we, uh, we'll do it at a price that's higher. So they kind of understand what I was just describing to you um, um, implicitly. Um, and um, you know we'll see if that's if that's true. Um, you know a morator a ban process is going to be a regulatory process, and there's going to be discussion. There'll be regulatory actions. There'll be reports and studies, analyses, ways of approaching. Um, however, a ban is implemented. You know, you, you could you could write a ban that says you know every permit done um, prior to. January 1, 2018 is exempt and anything after that is, um, is included and the, and the uh, permit becomes valueless. It, I mean, it, it's what they're thinking is, it's a market response, you know, to what they're, to, uh, what they're thinking. I don't know if it's gonna work. I think the, uh, the process of, um, I would hope that the process of a ban would be a regulatory rational discussion that included the public. Um, in the, how the discussion, you know, how a, a process would take place so that the, uh, the, uh, the ban has its effect for um, climate purposes. And it's an organized way of handling the decline of fossil fuels in the U.S. so that, you know, there doesn't have to be, what I most fear is that they would, that the industry would simply just throw people out of work, cut their benefits, you know, get rid of their pensions, uh, bankrupt the local communities where they're doing business and say, you know, we took our money and we're gone. You know, what you want out of a process like where, the, where there is some governmental involvement is a transitional strategy that, that, would, that would help people. So people don't lose their jobs and income, people don't lose their pensions. And, and that should be a central part of it, any kind of a, a planning process. Okay, I have one question left. <laughs> um, so I'm impressed that we've gotten through this and thanks to everybody for sticking with us who's still here. So the last question is, the National Science Foundation is funding a 10 year research project to turn natural gas into gasoline and petrochemical feedstocks. The researchers are using renewables to power the process and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and cost of the process so that it will be more advantageous than the oil to gasoline process. This is not mm -hmm. LNG. Could this have a chance of making an impact on the natural gas market? It could, you know, I think what you, you, you're going to see is, um, and right, not you're going to see, it's happening right now, except if you're not watching, you really have no idea that's going on because companies are doing it in some places and governments and others. And there's all kinds of um, research and experimentation going on, on, uh, you know, everything from, um, from that kind of discussion of the turning natural gas into some other form of fuel or to, I mean, I, we've seen some ones where oil is changed into various chemicals without a refining process. There's all kinds of um, um, ways in which the industry is looking to, um, um, to reinvent itself and to come up with ways that are, you know, um, more acceptable 
from a climate and environmental standpoint, but quite frankly, they're also looking for ways to come up with um, uh, profitable models for the use of uh, fossil fuels, because there are none right now. The, the models that are being that have been put together over the last several decades no longer function very well. So it's as much a um, attempt to deal with science and and uh, and the use of um, of uh, resources as it is to find, you know, new business processes that can be commercialized um, because they're struggling on that too. But there are, you know, there's a phone book full of, um, of uh, ongoing uh, um, research and innovation projects that you could find if you dig into the industry. If you look in, you know, China and Japan and um, around the world, you'd be surprised at how much is actually going on. This sounds like one of them. And you know, the federal government, I guess, is going to try to experiment with it and give it a shot as a demonstration. I, I don't, doesn't sound like it's particularly useful, but it, you know, that's going to happen. And the industry is doing a lot of it also. And the question is going to be in part, how competitive will that, that new approach be with what's already out there on the market? You know, because many of these projects and ideas that people talk about, you know, they end up being rather capital intensive, you know, they require a lot of processes. So will that really be cheaper than just going electric? That's the Yeah, question. I mean, I, I think Suzanne's right. I think that's right. And I, I think the question becomes for us, and this is a bit broader, and maybe it's a good last question, um, is, um, is, um, we're in an energy transition and that's a time of great change and a lot of um a lot of it, um, uh, required um innovation and thinking and 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 then you know new ways um new ways of of um of looking at things and um that's probably all to the good um as long it's uh, as long as we you know keep it public and keep the debate going um and to be able to get you know good information out of this stuff a lot of the uh innovation in the past has been secret and we don't know what it is and uh and right now the public's awareness is very is very high and so there's likely something good to come out of it but only if it's you know continues continues to be um continues to be debated and that there is then the patience for it, you know, um, and the political patience as well. It's, you know, I would think that anything that we that the, that uh, the environmental side of things is pr proposing now um, in terms of innovation is going to be um, shot down immediately. Um, like you're going to see in another year or two, probably the, uh, the fossil fuel industry take out after wind and solar for bankruptcies or something because that's bound to happen anywhere. Um, but on the flip side of it, as I think the uh, our side of it, uh, the environmental side, you know, needs to keep listening to, um, uh, to whatever the fossil fuel folks are coming up with to see, maybe they do. These are some of the more innovative and scientifically bright people we have in the world who work there and maybe they do come up with something. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. Wouldn't be surprised if they already have uh, better ways of doing things and they're just not doing, putting them out there because they're not commercial, but maybe the politics requires it. And in a sense that makes this process highly political, but in the best sense, right? Of finding a good answer and a new way to live together with each other on planet earth. Um, and I, so that I, I see that as a good discussion. Um, even if there are things that are gonna be done that I probably wouldn't agree with Thank you all so much. This has been wonderful. Thank you for your additional 30 minutes. We really appreciate it. And for all of those, all of you who have um, given us your additional 30 minutes, we really um, appreciate it. Uh, like I said, I will follow up with people with a lot of the resources that have been mentioned today. Um, and again, thank you, Aifa, for this great information and sharing and answering all of these questions. 
thank you for doing this and thank all of you for uh, being on the call where, you know, we're interested in uh, continuing a discussion with you individually with, with, uh, with organizations and, um, and where, um, you know, I am delighted that you organized this and I'm honored that people would want to sit around and do this um, for this longer period of time. And uh, we pre I really appreciate the, uh, the time that you've all put into this too. So thank you. It's very timely in New Mexico.